Okay, we are ready, folks. Welcome back. Welcome to Psychic Development Level 2. And if I can have everybody's attention up here, we will get started. Um, first, I want to give you an overview of Psychic Development Level 2. I know that many of you uh, were able to catch my webinar, um, which was held about a week ago on Psychic Development, Development Level 2. If you didn't catch it, it is available on YouTube. It's also on my site. It is a PowerPoint presentation which goes over in about a 45 minute period the highlights of what we're going to be covering over this two day period. So if you want to just catch the highlights or just have a review of things, that's a good place to go. And that PowerPoint presentation is and always will be free. Okay, so it's, it's out there for your use to study. Um, psychic Development Level 2 is about energy. It's about feeling energy. It's about seeing energy. By the time you are done with this seminar this weekend, you will have done your first psychic reading. And the beauty of it is it's going to come easily. It's going to come naturally. There is no, oh, could I do this involved? Because everything that we are going to be doing along the way is completely and totally and perfectly natural to you as a human being. Everybody can do this. And that's the beauty of what I'm teaching when I'm teaching you to work with energy. But this is more, far more than doing psychic readings. In this weekend, I'm going to attempt, hopefully, succeed in giving you an understanding of how energy works. So at the end of this weekend, at the end of this seminar, my hope is that you will also be able to understand the energetic interactions that are going on between you and every other human being. So that there'll be that little voice inside, no matter what interaction is happening, that says, oh, this is going on which will help you in every relationship and in every situation that you have. Because you see, we do live in a world of energy. And we're, we're going to take this from the baby steps of simply learning how to feel auras, to the next step, which is learning how to feel what's going on inside of another person's body through the energy we feel. We're going to learn how to translate that energy so that we, we can put it into our conscious mind as to what's happening. We're going to learn how to follow that energy to find out what's not just going on in someone's physical body, but in their emotional world and in their physical world around them. And we're also going to take it even a step further and learn how to energetically surf the worldwide psychic web. So by the time we get done with this next 10 hours of presentation, you are going to know how to find out anything, anywhere that you want to know. Now, you're also going to learn the morals and the values and the responsibility of having that knowledge. And you're going to learn how to protect yourself. Because I would never teach you part of that triad without the other two thirds. Okay, it's very important to get the whole ball of wax. People who develop their psychic abilities have to learn values and manners. And someday when we are learning to live in a completely psychic world, all of us have to have those manners, that etiquette built into us. So that we know, just as we talked about in Psychic Development Level 1, when I talked about don't intrude on someone else's thoughts unless you're invited. You don't just project at anyone. <laughs> okay? So the same thing is going to be true with Psychic Development 2. We have these built-in values, morals, ethics that you're going to learn along the way. And hopefully you'll be teaching your children and your children will teach their children so that this is built into the new world that is in the process of being created here. We are also going to learn to see energy. It's very easy, folks, to see the aura, not difficult at all. It is not easy to see colors in the aura. So everyone in this room and everybody who's watching this video in their homes 
is going to be learning to see the aura. That's easy. And I am going to give you the instructions, the how-tos, to train yourself to see color in the aura and to understand what those colors mean, which is another very interesting bit of information that you can utilize to help you to understand and work with people in your everyday life, as well as if you decide to work with your energy as a psychic, okay? So can I make you see the color? No, but armed with the instructions I'm gonna give you, everybody here should be able to see colors in the aura by the time we're done with this seminar, okay? So this, is the, this seminar is all about energy. Before we step into it, I want to take a few minutes to discuss some of the highlights and also to go over the homework that you got following Psychic Development Level 1. Okay? Um, the first thing, and a couple of these questions were asked as people came into the room today. Um, so, Ron, can you get that microphone ready so that we can, um, I think... Uh, Robin has it? Okay. okay. Mike, you had a couple of questions. Let's take uh, the one on chakras first, because that was very important. In Psychic Development Level 1, we learned about the chakra system, and we learned the psychic energy centers that connect our physical body to our emotional body to all the other layers of our psychic and spiritual bodies. And we learned how to open and develop those centers using the chakra exercise. And Mike came in, and he had a, a very, I think, a very important question about the chakras. There were a few questions, but we'll, we'll address Mike's first. When performing a chakra meditation, how important is it to pay attention to what each chakra looks like? And if there's a, a difference between chakras, um, whether the symbols are kind of like dreams in that dreams can be very personal and should be interpreted by each person differently. And, and the answer, Mike, is absolutely. The, the key word there was difference, okay, difference. If, for example, I'm going to give you a few options. If I'm doing the chakra exercise and I move the energy through the red chakra, the, the root, the orange chakra, the sacral, the yellow chakra, the solar plexus, and I'm now moving it through the heart, and all of a sudden I get a picture of myself as a young child, being spanked by my mother. That wasn't a random picture, and I wasn't just daydreaming. What my higher self is telling me is that there is some kind of blockage there, and it originated with that issue. So I now know what to work on, okay? Supposing I get to that heart chakra, and I'm supposed to be seeing green, and all of a sudden, I'm just seeing a wash of red. That could mean Either that particular chakra happens to be vibrating at a red level, which is fine, let it be what it wants to be, but it could also mean that at this time in my life, my love energy is totally linked to my sexual energy. Not uncommon, okay? So it's significant, not, not anything to be worried about or concerned about, just significant, okay? Supposing I get to that heart chakra and I fall asleep. Folks, this happened to me so many times when I used to be doing these before I would go to sleep at night. And I, I have to share this because this is so funny. I'd get to my solar plexus chakra, yellow, and I'd fall asleep. And I'd wake up in the morning seeing yellow, and the energy would go right up to the top of my head. And it took me a while before I realized that I must have a blocked solar plexus chakra, and all night long I was working on it. <laughs> okay? So if you should fall asleep on one of the chakras, that's an indication that that particular chakra needs more work. So what do you do? You visualize that color, and you visualize or you feel the sensation you get when the energy passes through there. You spend a little bit more time with it. Mike, did that answer your question? Good. And we had another question that was back here also about the chakras. Yeah, you. You were talking about closing them. Could you repeat your question? Actually, I'm not sure now that you talked about what you talked about, whether it was, was a chakra that was being closed, but there was some type, and I don't remember what type of center it was that was being closed, but it had to do with fear. 
So, but the question I had originally asked was um, that I had been in an, a workshop where somebody had closed an energy center. So I had asked, mm -hmm. you know, is that okay, something well, you we, want to do? Now you're phrasing this a little differently than you did before. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm not going, I, I don't know what the guided meditation you were uh, led through was all about. So, and I can't go there because I didn't lead it. Um, I can say that from my perspective, it, you know, if somebody has got a meditation, which is being able to help you to work through or close out or shut out fears, this is a good thing. But let's get back to the chakras. Okay. Um, it is in, in my way that I teach, especially at a level where you're learning to develop the ability to pass the energy in and out and through your chakras to develop them, it is inadvisable to close down any of your psychic centers. So you definitely want your psychic centers to all be open at this point. If you don't want energy coming into them because of a situation that you're in, you feel vulnerable, shield them literally by putting a silver reflective shield in front of each chakra. Hang, visualize it hanging in the air in front of you. Or put yourself into your energy balloon that you learned in P1, or just put yourself in the white light, a sphere of white light, and surround that sphere of white light with a mirror to reflect outwards. So there are some ways of protecting yourself, which are really pretty easy. Um, but don't close your chakras down. Not, not healthy, because right now you don't want to be focusing on closing. You want to be focusing on opening and developing those chakras. Okay? Okay, and we had, I think, Mike, you had another question? If it comes oh, to, yes, you, yes, yep. Yes. You mentioned in Psychic Development 1, uh, you gave an example about the idea that you had of your dream kitchen. And the uh, while our higher selves have no time frame, they operate in their own sphere, I guess. Um, I was asking, is it kind of like, is there a way to shield yourself or, or change the desires, fears, wishes that you have? So six, seven, eight years later, when they do come back to you, um, they do not affect you, say, negatively. Well, and the answer to that, it's, it's interesting, Mike. First off, and we're talking about for the average person, not one of you, because you folks are no longer average, because you have had the advantage of being through these classes and, all, and learning this information, okay? So you've already stepped out of that category. But for the average person who hasn't had this opportunity, the turnaround time, yes, is seven to eight to eight years between setting something in motion, and we set something in motion by having the thought and then powering it with our emotion. That's how we set something in, in, in motion. And for the average person, the thought will go out to the astral planes, hang out there, drift around for a while, and it will usually take it seven to eight years before it comes back here in the physical plane to manifest as actual reality. So, for example, you might have really, really had a major problem emotionally with your mother-in-law that at the time you couldn't respond to because of certain situations, so you held it in, you got really, really angry about it, and never did have a chance to let it go, and finally just said, you know, it's not important anymore, and stepped away from it, okay? Seven or eight years later, some little thing comes up that she says or does, and for no reason, this major emotional burst comes out of you. And even you were like, where did that come from? Well, you incubated it seven years ago. Folks, we do this all the time with our lives. We have this cycle because we put the thought out to the other planes and then the thought comes back into our physical plane. So the average person is a seven-year turnaround. For you, because you have learned via Psychic Development Level 1 how to focus your thoughts, how to project your thoughts, how to let your thoughts go, guess what? Your turnaround time is happening faster and faster and faster. And if you keep practicing your telepathy exercises, your turnaround time can eventually become instant. Think it, manifest it. That's one of the reasons we practice those exercises. So you are already 
getting to the point where you're recognizing the return of your thoughts because it's happening faster. The average person doesn't recognize the return of their thoughts because it's seven or eight years. They don't have a clue. So, Mike, the first step here is recognition. The first step is you have to become responsible for the fact that I have created this occurrence that's happening in my world. Whether it's a fear, whether it's an anger, or whether it's something good. You know, we can manifest good things we put a lot of emotion and thought energy into as well. The first thing is to take responsibility. Yes, I have manifested this. Then we can remember back to when we set it in motion. That's the first step, recognition. Now, on to your actual question. Mike is saying, okay, I'm at the point where I accept that I create my reality. I am recognizing that I have set this into motion. I might even remember the exact moment I set it into motion, and I don't like where this is going. I know where it's going if I don't change it. I want to change it. How do I change this thing I set in motion if it was a negative thing? And the answer is simple. I withdraw my energy from it. Which means that no matter how bad it is, I deal with it. I don't let it overcome me. I take care of it. But I don't put my emotional energy into it at all. Does that make sense? For example, how many of you have children? Show of hands. Okay. Didn't you discover somewhere along the line that when your child was being bad, when you yelled and screamed and threw a fit at that kid, that kid was even worse tomorrow because they got so much of your energy and attention, right? So what was the best way to control your bad kid? To totally ignore them. Okay, you're going you're gonna to cut up and make this kind of a scene when we're in the restaurant. Hey, honey, would you go on out in the car and sit with them? We'll just come out when we're done with our meal. How many of you have done that one? Yeah, and that kid never cut up again, did they? It works. Deprive them of the joy and the fun. And, okay, that one didn't work. Got to find a new one next time, okay? Well, this thought you set in motion is nothing more than a bad kid, okay? Yeah. Think of it that way, and you will have no trouble dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay? That was a very good question. Now, are there, I'll take one more. Are there any other questions that you've had after having had this last month, really, to think about everything that you learned and the things that you practiced in P1, even, even the working with your partners in Level 1? Right here we have a question. And your name? Debbie. Debbie. Um, my question is with my partner, I noticed initially we were right on with each other, but as we got to know each other better, we weren't. So I was wondering, th does that interfere when you know somebody really well? Is it clearer when you don't? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, Debbie, um, one of the interesting things in my classes, I, I really prefer that the person you're working with is a total stranger initially for a very different reason. And that is because the people who are your good friends and family members, you have already set up a psychic and empathic connection to, you see? And so it's not something you really need to learn to develop. So in these classes, I like you to work with somebody where you don't already have the road carved, and, and that way you're learning how to create new connections. Um, all of us are born with an AM radio that works very well in connecting us to other people. And what we want to have is an AM, an FM, a broadband, a wireless, one that can shoot to Mars. Okay, we want to have a, a radio transmitter in our cells that can cover everything everywhere. Okay? And the way to get that is by working with people we don't know and by working with a lot of people we don't know. Okay, so let's talk about what was happening here with Debbie and her friend. Okay, what she's saying is that as they got to know each other, they were not connecting as well. Does anyone here have any idea what might have been happening there? 
because there are a lot of possibilities. We need a break? Okay. Let, let's stop just for a moment here. Are we back okay, on? we're back on. Um, okay, so, so Debbie's question, I want to toss out to the group. Her question is, how come in her case, as she got to know her partner better, they stopped being able to connect as well? Mike, please. Okay, and your, your name? Luz. Could it be possibly because they're now knowing each other, so they're using now mental mind instead of energy? Absolutely, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, what's very interesting about this is that in what we were sending and receiving, we in this class were, we, we really had some pretty stringent guidelines. The first, uh, on the weekend itself, we had sent and received colored shapes. The next thing you were going to do uh, during the week, you were going to send and receive a simple object. The week after that, and of course, do your remote viewing. The week after that, you were going to take that simple object, and or a different one even, but a simple object, and put it into a scene. So you'll be seeing a whole scene. The following week, we were going to add a feeling or an emotion into that. So each week we were adding so that you were able to really be specific with what you were sending and receiving. And then just before you came, the last week before you returned here, you were supposed to be sending and receiving a person. Okay? Now, if you had stuck with those things, you would not have had that issue. Because, you see, there are no personal things involved with that. But if you were attempting to send and receive things that were going on in the person's life, or you were sharing one another's hurts or worries or fears or concerns, all of a sudden you're seeing those things in what's being sent or received. It's coloring it, do you see? So the, the interesting thing is that we have got with the people that we live with, the people who are our close friends, we have constant connections going on. If your best friend has an issue in her life and wants to talk to you, you know she wants to talk to you before the phone rings. You're thinking about her all day. That's because we have that road, that psychic road already created, that psychic connect to that friend or to that husband or that child. Here we're dealing with people who are strangers. That psychic connect isn't there until we connect it. So we can learn to connect it and take it away, and connect it and take it away. It's not a pre-created road or channel. You see how that works? Now, with the people who are in our lives, we're constantly commuting, em communicating empathically and telepathically. But we have very little control over what gets communicated. By learning to communicate with people who are our partners, we're learning the control because we don't have that emotional bond already created. But if you and your partner didn't just get to know each other as people, but exchanged confidences or told each other things about one another's lives that brought the emotional connections in, you see? Now you made that channel, let's say colored, with preconceptions. And so, yes, it's still there, and it's still working, and it's still operating, but now it's operating through that lens of color that's going to slant it a particular way. So, for example, if my husband Ron and I are sending a person to each other, and I know that he had a meeting with Robert, the, his friend, this morning, I'm going to automatically have the preconception that the person he's sending me is tall, and slender with brown hair. And I would be wrong because he's probably sending me Jack Benny. Okay, somebody that I don't really know well but could, could basically visualize, you see? So those preconceptions, our mental preconceptions get in our way. As long as we don't have an emotional connect to the person, we will have no preconception. And so this is why it's really good to practice these things with strangers, 
because, or, or, or just people we know very casually, because those connects are going to teach us the control. Once we have the control, we can start sending very clearly. So you see, um, if Ron does send me a picture of Jack Benny versus Robert, I am going to know the difference because he and I have practiced this so much, and I know the turn on, the turn off. Okay, I am not going to allow my emotions to color anything that comes through. Does that make sense? And that's just practice. It's just practice. Did, did that answer your question, Debbie? Yes. Okay. Okay. And we had another question over here, and, and please say your name, and then let's hear the question. Hi, I'm Meredith. I go by Mary, though. Okay, Mary. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone else had this experience after the first training, and maybe you'll deal with this because you said it was energy, but I find that my nervous system is very sensitive, and after the first training, it took me a couple of days to really feel almost like I left my body and to get back in. And then as the month went on, more and more things started to come to me, and it almost got a little overwhelming where I wanted to sort of shut it down. And then I get skeptical. I said, oh, this is like I'm making this up. This is getting too much. And so it gets a little scary at times. So I'm wondering if that is kind okay. of a normal that, thing. Those are good questions, Mary, because honestly, everyone who's taking these classes at some point or another is going to experience the same thing. So always remember your question is going to be the answer of well, the, the same question that somebody else in this room or somebody else taking psychic development two is or one is going to have, okay? Here's the answer. Meditate, okay? This is why in level one, I kept making very clear to you that meditation is different than psychic work. When you meditate, what state is your mind supposed to be in? Everybody? Stillness. When you meditate, are you supposed to be getting beautiful flashes of light? No. When you meditate, are you supposed to be getting incoming messages from your guides? No. When you meditate, are you supposed to be hearing celestial angelic music? No. What are you supposed to be hearing or seeing when you meditate? Nothing. Your mind is still and empty and just relaxed. Ooh. Do you know how nice that is to be able to rest your mind? Wow. Okay. Now, when you do that yogic style meditation with the focus on the breath, you do your progressive relaxation. You don't do a chakra meditation because that energizes and brings the energy up and makes you feel off balance. And you're not doing your long distance viewing and you're not reaching out to long distance view during meditation and you're not asking a question and then going out to search it during meditation. No, you're not doing any of that. You're doing your progressive relaxation. If you need to protect yourself to feel more settled in what you're doing, you do that. You use your worry box to clear your mind and then you focus on your breath and emptying and stilling your mind, and there's a very interesting side effect. Your energy becomes totally relaxed, still, and grounded. Okay? The oddest thing, you can open the doorway to your higher self, and within the physical body, become totally settled, grounded, know exactly where you begin and you end. Meditation's the key. Okay. So, Mary, what weren't you doing? I meditated for the first week. Right. I meditated for the first week. Mm -hmm. And but I was doing the sh I do I'm a long time TM practitioner. Right. And so that's what I normally do, but, but I was doing different. the chakras. Mm -hmm. And I said I have to stop doing this. But then I stop meditating also. Yes, no, no, because I put them now, together. You can do the meditation at one part of the day, and then you do chakras at a different part of the day. Okay? Keep them separate because your meditation needs to happen at this point every single day of your life for like the next three years. After that, 
Maybe you can meditate twice a week for the same effect. Folks, I want to share this with you. This is a truism. It's a sandy truism. I meditated for like five years straight every day. I walked around. It's amazing when you become a meditative personality. I didn't have to know what was going to happen next. I was automatically in the right place at the right time for the right thing to happen. It's amazing. When you become that meditative personality, you are centered. You know what thoughts are yours and what thoughts aren't, what emotions are yours and what emotions aren't. You know exactly how to interact with this next space or not interact with it, when to leave the room, when to stay. It's absolutely amazing the kind of control you get over your life when you are that meditative personality. I became that meditative personality moving through life, and life formed itself around me, and it was amazing and beautiful. And then I said, wow, I have this down. I don't need to do it anymore. And I said, you know, I can decrease it. I don't have to get up a half an hour early every morning. Um, I'll get up a half an hour early three times a week. And um, a few weeks later, you know, this is work and I'm good. Um, so maybe I'll only do it once a week. And, you know, I teach classes once a month. Well, that's enough. About a year into it, I was no longer that meditative personality. I was no longer so grounded. Other people's emotions were getting me, were pulling me into their dramas. Other people's mental issues were overwhelming me and became mine. Does this sound like some of you? So, folks, I had been meditating daily for five years. And when I got away from it, all that garbage started happening again. Because, you see, we live in a society where we are surrounded by other people with other minds, other sets of emotions, and they can be overwhelming. We're going to learn more about that in today's session, because today, P2, is about energy, and this is really about energy. So, you have to continue to meditate. I am now 35 years into my own practice. I meditate, folks, every day. Did I answer your question, Mary? Yes. Okay. And so it's about staying grounded, which meditation, the meditation yeah. will create. Exactly. You know, uh, peop some people, I've had students, some people say to me, you know, um, when, when I meditate, I'm totally ungrounded. I feel like I'm not even protected and blah, 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 blah. I'm way out there. And I'm like, well, how are you meditating? Are you meditating on the breath with the object being your mind being still relaxed, empty, and focused on nothing? And they say, well, no, I was taught to meditate with guided visualization. I, I'm a bird. I go out and I visit my friends. I, I open to my higher self. I get messages. None of that is meditation. All of that is entering psychic space. Alpha space, alpha mind, alpha brain waves can be used to achieve a meditative state of mental stillness or it can be used to create this open, daydreamy, come and get me state, which is extremely dangerous unless you are also a meditative personality. You got it? Believe it or not, what I have to tell everybody is please, when you're doing your telepathy exercises with your partners, don't meditate while you're doing these exercises because if you're meditating properly, guess what? They can't get through. Your meditation is so complete and total, your mind is so still, that everything bounces off it. Isn't that an interesting concept? So meditation is a very, very safe and protected and grounded place to be. Okay? Yes, we have a question back here. We've been having a really hard time with our telepathy exercises. And what I've been doing, and I'm wondering if this is the reason we're having a hard time or not, I've been imagining opening my chakras. Is that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do before I send? <laughs> it's not a good thing. Okay. Um, here's the problem. What comes to mind is, is years ago, um, when we were in P2, as a matter of fact, so this is a good, good thing for me to tell you right now, we had partners sitting there working together, doing <coughs> readings on each other, energetic work. And uh, one poor woman is working with this girl, and all she can get, all she can get 
is white light with blue ribbons. Over and over again. I just, I'm getting a headache. And all I get is white light and blue ribbons. And finally, I said to the woman she was working with, can I ask you, what are you doing? Well, I'm surrounding myself with white light and protecting myself, and I'm bringing through God, and I'm just making believe on the sun. And I'm like, well, how can she possibly get anything else? Point made? <laughs> okay. When it, it would be fine to do your chakra exercise before to build your energy up. Then let it go and do it 10 minutes before so that you're not still in it. Okay. One of the interesting things about when we work together with our telepathy exercises is that we collect information. Minds have a way of holding on to things. And remember these telepathy exercises are working mind to mind. So remember I had said last time we met, if I'm late for my exercise and I jump out of the car and I jump over the kid's bicycle and I run in the house and I you know, zip around the corner in the orange kitchen and go down to my blue bedroom and sit down on my bedspread that's white and pick up the book that I'm going to send a picture from. And I don't like the first one that has a woman on it. So I put it down. I pick up the book that's got the elephant. And the person that I'm now trying to send to gets this jumble. Gee, I felt like there was this long hose-like thing, but it was wrapped around a car. <laughs> And the car was white, and you were sitting in it, but you were sitting on an orange seat. Do you see what happens? Okay. So it's very important for you to be in that space and in your, in your own energy for at least 10 or 15 minutes before. Okay. Otherwise, the person you're trying to send to is needing to sort through this jumble. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and you are? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Um, back to meditation. I have a question. In the period of time in meditation when we're doing the yogic part with the breathing and the stilling the mind, what's the difference with using a mantra during that time? The purpose of mantra, and by the way, mantra can be used all through meditation where the sound just becomes a distant sound, a part of your breath, and you blend into the sound and there's nothing. But the way we learned to use mantra in level one was a quick means of getting ourselves into a relaxed alpha state. So you could either use it with your progressive relaxation or you could use it in place of your progressive relaxation. However, if you're going through a tense time in life, if you've got a lot of anxiety, stick with the whole progressive relaxation. Okay, so mantra can be a shortcut, but it's, it's not always an effective shortcut. Okay, um, I also taught you alternate nostril breathing in psychic development level one. And it can be used the same way I just described that mantra can be used as a shortcut, but not if you're going through a lot of tension or anxiety. Then you need the entire progressive relaxation long form. You can even use just counting one to ten. Or when you get really good out of it, just say ten, ten, ten. Did you just feel what happened to your bodies? You're getting trained. Isn't that lovely? OK. But if you're going through that period of high anxiety, 10, 10, 10 is not going to work either. You need the whole detailed progressive relaxation. So don't lie to yourself, because you're the only one who suffers from the fibs. Do what you know you need to do. OK. All right. I would like to take one dream as we move forward into P2 one dream to interpret, and then we're going to take a little break. And on the break, I want you to get together with your partners, to discuss your telepathy exercises, your remote viewings, to make sure you're on the same page, and also to discuss at least one do-good while we take that break, okay? That way you'll all be able to interconnect and, and, and get all that information. But let's talk about a dream first, and then we'll take our break, and following that, we're going to move forward into Psychic Development Level 2. Who has a dream that they would like to share that we could do a quick interpretation with? Remember, you have a dream journal you created all week. OK, can we have the microphone up here with Louis? Actually, I have a question about that. Um, I was speaking with a friend of mine yesterday, and he told me, well, a new acquaintance, and he told me that uh, 
he's actually been having problems because he had a reoccurring dream Mm -hmm. nightmare actually and in the nightmare he actually goes to a party and he starts killing people in the party and he is seeing let's let's use his dream then okay Okay. so we have this young man we can't get feedback from him unfortunately but we'll use him we have a young man we don't know his name we're just going to use that he's a young man so in his dream in his dream he's in a party okay now first i need to know something about the party is the party at his house a friend's house someone else's house house? he doesn't know a house he doesn't know okay unknown house and it's a reoccurring dream okay and at the party at the party he starts killing people okay he starts killing people he starts seeing it through his eyes first person and through the eyes of the people being killed okay so initially he's watching it from outside but when he gets into the act of doing the killing he's seeing it both from his through his own eyes and through the other person's eyes correct and he also feels the emotions Okay. And what happens next? He wakes up um, and it got get to a point where it took him three hours before he could get out of the bed. Okay. So now two questions you may not have asked him or he might not have told. When you're having a dream, emotion is another symbol. All dreams are about symbols. Your higher self is giving you information in symbols. If you have a recurring dream, you're having that recurring dream because your higher self thinks this one's important enough to keep giving you until you get it. That's all a recurring dream really is. When you get it, the recurring dream goes away. Okay? If you want to know more about it, and this is what can start to happen as you become more aware of your dreams, and you should go back and tell this to your friend, okay? As you become more aware of your dreams, and you're getting this recurring dream, or maybe you just get a dream that was very interesting and you feel like you might have it, but you don't have it completely. Next time you go to sleep, rub your third eye, say to your higher self, you know that dream you've been giving me or that dream I had last night? Um, I need you to give me a little more. So could you give it to me again, but change something so I get more information from it? And believe it or not, you'll he might go back into this dream, only uh, now the dream's at his parents' house. It'll be a shift. Or he might go back into the dream and instead of him killing the people and, and seeing through his eyes and their eyes, um, as he kills somebody, they give him a rose. You know, there's going to be a shift in the dream. And you can do this on successive nights and actually develop a kind of a conversation back and forth between you and your higher self. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so tell him he has that control. He can do that. Okay, and also tell him when he has understood the dream, it will no longer be recurring. Um, I had a friend, and this is not an uncommon dream, all of her life from childhood on up, she was having a dream that she was standing on a beach and she was watching a tidal wave, a wall of water, come towards her. Okay? Well, it was really interesting because her dream stopped when she finally got married and had sex. Okay, now, water talks about emotion. Water talks about the subconscious, the unconscious mind. And this woman came from a battered childhood, a broken home, a lot of difficulty with men, avoided men until she finally found her perfect mate that she was comfortable and happy with. She never had the tidal wave dream again. So what was the dream about? I'm staying on the beach. I'm not going to go in that water. I'm not going to allow myself to experience emotion in any way, shape, and form. But the tidal wave came and got her anyway. And when she recognized that this was the person, the dream totally disappeared. She never had it again. Okay, so the dream, as violent as it may be, doesn't mean that it is about violence. Okay, when I left New York back in 1989, For about a year before I left New York, I was having, now I spent a lot of time on the highways. Anybody who's been in New York knows about Mm -hmm. the 
long parking lots up there, okay, the ones that move. And so I spent a lot of time on the highway. Well, in, in my recurring dream that I had for a year before I left New York, I was walking down Southern State Parkway, and all the cars I was passing were stopped. They had all been in accidents. They were falling apart. They were in all different ways of deterioration. There were dead people with blood and gore hanging out the windows. There were people lying on the ground, smushed. And doesn't this sound gross? OK, sorry about being so graphic, but I really want you to get the point. Folks, I don't dream in nightmares. I don't have nightmares, OK? I just don't. I, I, me and my guides have an agreement. I don't get nightmares. So why would my higher self give me a nightmare that repeats? Because, you see, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that it was time for me to leave New York. I know that sounds strange. I spent all this time on the highways, and they were saying, it's dead, Sandy. It's gone. Go away, in the most graphic way possible that they could. I finally made my mind up I was going to leave New York, put my house on the market. Never had a dream again. That was the end of that. Okay? So understand that your, your violent dreams usually are to get your attention. Okay? Once they have your attention and you begin to figure them out, they do not need to be violent any longer. And I've had a lot of students who are afraid of their dreams because of the violence of them. And usually that's just because you're not paying attention to the messages. Okay? Uh, Luis, I'd bet you anything that now that your friend is talking about the dream and paying attention to it, it will not be as violent. The interesting thing is he just was trying to inquire more about lucid dreaming, which right. he didn't believe in mm -hmm. until he started researching on it. And for the past week, he's been now realizing in dream state that I'm dreaming and controlling it. Yes. And he's going somewhere else. Right. And lucid dreaming. So he has uh, had For those stopped. of you who aren't aware, because we haven't really discussed this yet, but lucid dreaming is waking up while you are in the dream. And, of course, that's a really neat thing to do, because if you wake up in the dream, you can begin to control the dream. Uh, another quick little uh, incident that happened with a student who had a long-term, from childhood on up, repetitive dream where she would leave work, walk through a tunnel to get home. Now, the tunnel really existed. It was a physical plane tunnel, but the rest of the dream didn't. She would enter the tunnel, and she was totally alone in the tunnel. And as she was walking, she would see two men come in from the front of the tunnel. And she'd turn around to go back, and there'd be another man coming from the other side. And she could only see the silhouettes. And as they got closer, she saw that they had guns. And just as they got close enough that she could almost see their faces, but not quite, but close enough to shoot her, she'd wake up. She never finished the dream. But needless to say, she was in a panic over this dream for most of her life, OK? Well, what she learned through lucid dreaming is that she could wake up in the dream and she could change it. And she began, she worked with a psychologist. She began to understand that this dream was a manifestation of her fear again about men. She had been molested as a child. And even though that was years and years and years ago, the standard, standard uh, concepts here, what do you think a tunnel is, folks? What do you think guns are? OK? And there's standard sexual connotations in those symbols. So she was having this repetitive dream that was really more than a fear of sex. It was a fear of male authority. And she had trouble with her husband. She had trouble with her boss. She had trouble with her son. She just didn't get along with any of the men in her life. So here's what she did with her lucid dreaming. She woke up in the dream, and this takes practice, but you can rub your third eye and say to your higher self, if I have a dream that's important, please make, wake me up while I am still dreaming in the dream. Try that, folks, when you go home. It's a very effective tool for learning to start your lucid dreaming. So she woke up, and she let the guys come closer. Now she's no longer dreaming. She's awake in her dream. And as they walked up to her, she changed their guns into roses. And they all gave her big bouquets of roses. And then they all walked out of the tunnel together. And she stopped having trouble with her husband. And she stopped having trouble with her boss. And she stopped having trouble with her son. It's amazing. 
Folks, the Aborigines believe that the dream world is the real world. And this world is the manifestation of our dreams. And now you can understand why they believe that. Because if you are a lucid dreamer, you can orchestrate and change things that are going here on the physical plane. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, so let's get back to this young man's dream now that we have some of this background information. The most important part of the dream, really, is the where the dream is taking place and who the dream is about. So this man starts the dream where he is an objective observer. He's outside of himself watching himself, and he's looking at himself being at a party in an unknown house. Folks, we all have an unknown house out there on the other planes. You, you folks now that you have your workspace might call it your workspace. It is kind of a representative of self out there. And when you don't know the house, that's usually what the house is. Okay? If the dream is taking place on the ground floor, the dream is referring to your everyday life. If it's taking place in the basement, it's referring to your subconscious fears. If it's on the higher levels, the attic or top attic, it's referring to progressively higher levels of being, maybe a dream coming from your higher self. Did this gentleman, Luz, tell you which floor the dream was on? I, I, I believe it's a bungalow house, one floor. Okay, so we're going to assume upstairs. then that this dream is on the first floor. So he's talking about his everyday life, his internal psychic persona on the other planes, but as it walks through this life, okay? So this dream is speaking really to his unconscious persona, what's going on inside of him. And he's at a party. So one of the things we know right away is that there is a party in the house which is the representation of him. There's a party in this man's house. There's a party in his head, Luz. There's a party in his emotions. There's a party in his life. Is he a person who feels like he's in control of his life? He's an objective observer when he starts out to the party going on within himself. He's orchestrating his life according to his parents and his friends and his teachers and his boss and his colleagues and his coworkers. And it's like he doesn't even live there. See that? Okay. And then he becomes a participant, and he starts killing the people. But as he's killing the people, he's seeing the people through both his own eyes and their eyes. Who is he killing, folks? Himself. Himself. Through all those other people. He's saying, out of my space, I get, I'm getting rid of the old me. I'm going to be in charge of the new me. He's killing all these representations of self that he no longer wants to be within the house, which is him. Pretty clear dream, okay? Good dream, actually. Now, what I was talking before about the emotions, emotions are very important in a dream. Notice, in a dream, because they are another symbol. We can have how we react in the dream, back to my idea of going, or my dream of going down Southern State, walking along the side of the road, and seeing all this horrible, devastation of cars and bloody bodies and parts and and guess what I felt nothing I'm just taking a walk down the side of the road oh look at that hmm. wow look at that one I had no reaction whatsoever folks I can't even look at a horror movie ask Ron I'm like this take it away you know so for me to have a dream where I felt nothing is significant that just told me the dream is not about a real thing the dream is something within me Okay, so his emotion in the dream was important. Did he feel joy? This is happy. Did he feel sorrow? This is, wow, I hate to see those parts of me go. It's, it's significant. Now, upon waking from the dream, there's a different emotion. When I woke up from my dream of body parts and cars, I was like, oh, God, that was a, whew, wow, whole different emotion. Okay? So the dream or the emotion that you have after you wake up and your conscious mind kicks in doesn't count. So he laid there in bed for a half an hour feeling devastated, thinking about it. Oh, my God, am I going to kill people? That doesn't count. It was not part of the dream. 
okay? And thank you, Louis, for sharing that, okay? The reason I like to put a dream up here is so that you folks can get some insight as to the basic tools and the how-tos. And honestly, some of the most important and direct dreams that give the best information are going to be the ones that are real, short, and concise. And this is also why it's a good idea to find a message board online to post it on and get people to help you to interpret it or to bounce it off of your partner in class because some of these dreams you're, you are just too close to. You want to read into them. But if you bounce it off of somebody else, it becomes much easier to interpret. Okay? Yes, all the way back here we have a question. A purple purple real, shirt. Uh, yeah. Real quick, I wanted to ask, um, could there be a chance that could it also be that uh, uh, remembering of a past experience? Lose the Luz is asking, could he be remembering a past life experience? Sure. Could he be uh, connected into somebody else on the planet who's going to be a mass murderer and do something like that? Sure. Could he be looking at his own desire to get rid of a lot of people in his life subconsciously? Sure. Um, but all of those things are like maybe, 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 maybe. They're, they're alternate interpretations. They're worthy of a, foot, of a footnote as a just in case. But please, 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 please do not go for the shock interpretation of the dream, which a lot of us will do. You know, folks, one of my major issues with our society in general today is that we have become so immersed in drama that we stop living reality. So don't take another step to start allowing your dreams to put you into another drama just in case you're running out of some real life ones, okay? So let's make a footnote out of that one, okay? And let's look at it as it will directly apply to us now, <laughs> okay? So the answer is yes, yes, and yes, but that's not nearly as clear as the one that I just gave, okay? Yes. Yeah, let, let's let, and your name? Um, my name is Donna. Um, this ties into, you said, like, this was a good example because it was short. And I've been having trouble um, maintaining my dream uh, journal because I'm writing a book every time. Isn't it lovely? Like, I can be writing, like, eight, ten pages. Uh -huh. And I I can't do that, like, three or four o'clock in the morning. Here's oh, but you definitely should. <laughs> I, uh -huh. I well, won't go should. back to sleep. <laughs> Donna, um, let, me, let me say this. Uh, like you. I get some, the dreams that usually come from my higher self are like this. They're short, they're concise, wow, they pack a punch, bam. But, you know, they're not the fun dreams. The fun dreams are the ones that are really long. I've even had dreams that have consecutive chapters that can go on for a week or two, you know? <laughs> they're great. Going, I love to go to sleep, you know? I, a lot of my books I dream, okay? I've dreamed other people's books, and then you have to be a little careful because you don't want to write something that somebody else is getting ready to dream. You know, there I am dreaming it, and then I happen to see it out there, and it's a bestseller. You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in our dreams, we we link to other people. We do all kinds of amazing things. Um, what I would do with those real long, lengthy dreams is I would take the highlights and list them. I can't. Okay. I can't. They're they're so um, detail oriented, mm -hmm. um, vivid colors, Great. smell, scents, everything. See, I don't find issues with that. I think that's wonderful, and write and turn <laughs> them into books. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It it really sounds to me like you know you've unlocked one of your you know your higher self, the part of you or your one of your guides, the part of you that really wants to get that information and inside out there and uh, says, okay, I'm free, let's go, let's write, <laughs> okay? I love it, I love it, I think it's great. And you had, this is our last question before we break, folks. Is it safe to say then that a lot of our dreams really are aspects of ourselves? Yes, here's the way that I interpret dreams. And by the way, I am not the dream master. There are some wonderful books out there on dream interpretation. I have book lists in my 
uh, psychic development books, please consult those books and go out and get them. Uh, books on lucid dreaming, books on psychological interpretations of the dream, out the states. There's a lot of work out there in dreams, and it's all worth reading. But the way I look at dreams, the first way I interpret it is, what is this saying about my psychological, emotional state right now as I move through life? What information is it giving me right now that I can utilize to make this life better? That's my first way of interpreting it. After that, I'll take it, okay, if I'm out there on the astral and I'm looking at it from a different point of view, what's the message from my higher self, the overall message? If I am on the astral and I'm actually taking part in this thing that's going out there on the astral plane, what is it that's happening? Um, years back, I'm still looking for it. It's on my computer somewhere. We used to have, you're going to love it, it was the astral bar. <laughs> when I owned Star Child Books, we had an online chat room that was very, very active, and we had an astral bar. Mike, you remember that. And we used to meet there. Yeah. And then we'd, we'd have the chat the next week, and we'd say, hey, were you wearing blah, blah, blah? Yeah, and I was sitting on that stool at the end of the bar. We talked about what we did in the astral bar, okay? So yes, you can actually be out there, out of the body, on the astral experiencing, okay? So your dream can be interpreted as a physical reality right now. It could be interpreted as emotional insights that you need into yourself to make life better in the now. It can be interpreted as a message from your higher consciousness, and by the way, it always is. Dreams that you, your higher consciousness is always involved on some level. There is always some input there because it's constantly talking to you. And there is also very frequently an astral component to the dream, which you would recognize because those dreams which are astral feel like you are there. This boy's dream went from him observing the dream to him being in the dream. It went from a dream to an astral dream, okay? Which doesn't mean it's going to happen here. It happened there, okay? Okay, I think that answered that question. And thank you folks very much. I want you to take a break. On your break, remember, get together with your partner. Share a do-good. Do that first. We need those do-goods to come out. We need show-and-tell. Why? Because every time you share a do-good, you are patting yourself on the back, your, that unconscious part of you that's giving you psychic information, and you're going to get more of it because of the positive reinforcement. Okay? So what you want to do is to share it with somebody else at home. We come in here. We share at least one with our partner. I also want you to share and make sure that you have tracked all four of the exercises, the telepathy exercises that we did during the last month. Make sure you connect it on all four of these and compare your, your remote viewing as well. Okay, and stretch. You know, like I said with the combination, um, she, 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 she moved her seat, so I, the gal who was over here who was just asking about um, no, you, you are here, about not making that connection as well. You may find that there was so much also going on in your lives that you, you were getting a composite of imagery instead of just one. So track it back. Look for where it applies. And you may find that you did better than you thought. Okay? Um, it is, uh, well, let's take, let's do this fast. Let's take a 10-minute break. Okay? And that'll be time to go to the bathroom, get some water too.